beautiful platform for nonprofit services. Um, I'm it's, I'm really pleased to have today's guest is a person I've known for wow how long has it been Adam like like 1988 since I think when you first walked into ninth grade in the freshman year there at Salisbury High School. Uh, but anyway, I'm very pleased to present um, not just my classmate, but also like like uh, Greg said, the uh, community engagement director of NC Child, um, Mr. Adam Sotok. So um, I, I definitely, you know, a lot of folks may not know about NC Child, but before we get into that, maybe Adam, you could tell the folks out there a little bit about yourself and your path to uh, joining um, NC Child before we talk about the organization. Sure. Thanks, Rocky. And it's great to be here today on the podcast and to see you as always <laughs> and hopefully uh, share some some helpful information with folks. So, um, you know, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Adam Sotok. I actually was born in West Virginia, uh, but then my mother and I moved down to Salisbury, North Carolina back in 1987 um, when I was a youngster and uh then I've lived in North Carolina ever since. You know, I love the state of North Carolina, and this is where I've made my home and where I do my work. I graduated from Salisbury High School, and then I went up to Appalachian State, and I got my BSW, my Bachelor's in Social Work degree from Appalachian back in 1996. And, you know, at that point in time, it's like I, I kind of just had this general sense of like, hey, I want to do something to be helpful, you know, make the world a better place. But you know, didn't have mm -hmm. a lot of, of polished ideas around that. So I went and worked for a couple of years at a wilderness camp uh, for teenage boys uh, in near Mount Airy, North Carolina. Um, you know, it was a it was a, a an alternative to juvenile detention, really. And, you know, learned a lot during that two year stint that I worked there. And what it really impressed upon me is, you know, the bigger community-based societal factors that were working against these kids, you know, and it was, and so it really made me think a little bit more about like, okay, well, how could I have an impact maybe more at a macro level or, or, or what have you? And so went back to UNC and got my uh, master's in social work degree. And one thing that I thought that I always tell folks that I thought was really cool about that is if you have your bachelor's in social work, you can get your master's in 12 months, one calendar year. And um, so that was that was uh, pretty enticing to me. And so went back and did that in the late 90s. And, and during uh, when I was getting my MSW, one of the major things you do is a practicum, an internship. And I actually did my internship with the agency I'm with now. It had okay. a different name way back when. It was called the North Carolina Child Advocacy Institute. Hmm. But um, that's where I did my internship. And actually, the executive director now at NC Child was my internship supervisor. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it introduced me more and more to this world of policy advocacy and community work. And so then I went off and for 15 or 16 years did work on uh, democracy and uh, trying yeah. to strengthen democracy in the state of North Carolina with a nonprofit group called Democracy North Carolina. Um, we actually did a lot of work in the Charlotte Mecklenburg area and the Piedmont region and other places across the state. And then you know, 2015, I'd, I'd been doing that for quite a bit for, for a long time. And, you know, child advocacy has always been something that's also been interesting to me and a passion for me. And so I had an opportunity to loop back around and do this yeah. similar type work with NC Child. And I've been here since 2015 uh, doing this work. So you mentioned the term child advocacy. For those out there who, you know, might just hear this term, like how would you define child advocacy? I would define it, Rocky, as as trying to work with others to change policies and systems okay. that work better for children and families so that it, rather than having to deal on mm -hmm. the back end of problems so often, which is very important. Like we obviously need yeah. to do that and support people that have that have been through trials in their life, right? But what to me, what advocacy is about is about yeah. trying to prevent those things from happening in the first place by right. improving the system. So so in that child advocacy, like you said, you're looking at policy and systems. So it's a little different than say if you were like a guardian ad litem, you know, and you're working on one, you're advocating for one child. But the, it sounds like the purpose that you've taken is looking at more 
the policies, meaning the laws, the statutes, the you know the administrative code, what whatever memos that these uh, DSS or whoever else is getting from the state, and of course the systems that are around us, from Medicaid to SSI to all all of those things. And so I, it sounds like you took that that real uh, interest in the child advocacy and probably went in my opinion, probably the foremost child advocacy organization here in North Carolina, NC Child. And so for those who um, probably have either or maybe may, might have heard of NC Child or, or may have never heard of NC Child, could you give us just a little bit of an overview of NC Child and how it relates to child advocacy as you described it? Sure, Rocky. Yeah, we're a state-based po public policy advocacy organization. We're based in Raleigh. Our mission, as Greg mentioned at the beginning, is to advance public policies to ensure that every child in North Carolina has the opportunity to thrive, whatever their race, ethnicity, or place of birth. And we do that. What a, one way I like to describe it, folks, is we do we do four main things in order to try to achieve that. We do community engagement, and that's mm -hmm. the work that I do. You know, working with partners and communities all over the state. We do direct and grassroots lobbying and advocacy. So we have a lobbyist that roams the halls in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we, we try to advocate directly. We do communications. So obviously we got to get our message out, work with the media, you know, let folks know what we're up to. And then we do data and research. So mm -hmm. NC Child is, is there's a national network called the Kids Count Network through the mm -hmm. Annie Casey Foundation. And every state has an organization that hubs that data and information and NC Child is that group here in North Carolina. Okay, wow, well, you kind of broke it down pretty easily there. So community engagement, direct and grassroots lobbying, communications, data and research. And I know when we had our sort of pre-Zoom uh, call to talk about what we're going to talk about, um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about the, the direct and grassroots lobbying. And because, you know, um, we just had a legislative session that I, I think, actually dragged into 20, uh, 2021 legislative session, dragged into 2022. Um, but I think, you know, for those who kind of follow, you know, sort of state politics or just state government, or just state life in general, I think this was the first time and I and maybe you can elucidate, I, I think it's what, like three or four years since they've had like an actual approved budget in, in the state legislature. And so maybe you could tell talk about because they've actually come up with a budget um, what from a policy and, and statute um, perspective are affecting children and families that now that wasn't in the previous budget or, or some changes kind of maybe uh, educate us about kind of, because it was a pretty historic legislative session and maybe we could just, you could maybe educate us about sort of significance of it. Yeah, happy to Rocky, you know, and feel free to you know, step in and ask me questions as I go along. Or, yeah, or please whatever. unmute yourself or shoot something in the chat. Because again, this is a interactive, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of styled as a, a seminar slash, you know, um, just, just, yeah, everybody counts here. So yeah, that it's not, it's, I know it's Friday's where I give it, really Friday's with all of us, right? So that, <laughs> feel free to jump in. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate it, Rocky. And you know, of course, let me say too, you're talking about the legislature and everything, we all know it's all in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. I mean, you know, that's the overarching factor for all of us, for children in the state of North Carolina, for everyone. So I just feel like every policy that we're working on from NC Child's standpoint is obviously heavily influenced by the Adam, pandemic. In your opinion, do you think if COVID-19 had not occurred, do you think we might still be in this sort of stasis of, uh, I don't know, political hockey that's been going on for X years? Or do you think the pandemic actually like proved to be an X factor to actually get the legislature to actually do something that they're constitutionally opposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know, I do think Rocky it was a helpful factor in mm -hmm. in finally getting over the line to get a state budget. I think there was just there's just been so many pressing things that need to be addressed that the idea of walking away without a state budget again just seemed ridiculous. <laughs> and so, you know, I do think it's an overarching factor. It's hard to know what what would have happened otherwise, but um, there's just so many needs. I mean, all the way down to just the 
direct effect on children. I mean, a, a statistic that's glaring to me that 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 I talk about is that 4,000 kids in our state have lost a parent or caregiver during the pandemic. I mean, wow. just just that immediate factor. I mean, children are losing their their parents and their caregivers um, to this. Dig into that, like, what is it? What are they passing away from COVID, or is it? Yes. Just really, okay. Those are those are specifically COVID related deaths. Okay. I mean, of course, those situations come up, unfortunately, in in other ways now, too. But this is just specifically the impact of COVID nineteen, and that's mm-hmm. just the tip of the iceberg because right. you're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, that. And then of course there's just all the systems and the way they've been. Are, are they including some of the, I mean, again, you know, how you define like sort of related, like from COVID or what, are they really, are they including like, cause I, I know I've seen statistics where, um, you know, they call like deaths of despair, you know, obviously we weren't doing great with the opioid <laughs> thing prior to COVID. And it seems that, you know, obviously, quarantine, isolate, these aren't exactly uh, great fertile grounds for recovery or, or avoiding addictions and such. And so it, in, in your, in that, in this 4,000, are we talking also about those types of like losses of life or this is, we're just talking straight, like I was on the incubator, intubator or something right. like that. That's a good question question Rocky I don't I, I don't want to answer because I don't know exactly yeah. I mean, it's my understanding that this is like the exact like this is from like the health wow. the, phys- okay, so the physical health implications that's, that's a 4,000 I mean character I mean because you know there's only x amount of like you know like what homes and and, and foster parents and, and adoptive parents out there that I mean right there from a child perspective it sounds like you're just kind of flooding the uh the child welfare system when you lose caregivers, right? So COVID already just, that's, you know, kind of hasn't really kind of affected that, it sounds like. Absolutely. It's putting stress on, like when you talk about the child welfare system, it's putting stress on a system that's already overwhelmed and overburdened in so many ways. We already had pre-pandemic a historic number of children, you know, in out of home uh, placements, uh, and which is largely due, as you mentioned just a minute mm-hmm. to the to the opioid epidemic in our state. Of course, other mm-hmm. factors too. So, it, it's just like COVID in so many ways through through fuel on fires that were already happening. I mean, mm-hmm. we could go down the line. I mean, the earl, the child care system, the right. health system, the mental health system mm-hmm. for children. K through 12 schools and uh, academic performance, uh, it, you know, it, it just goes on and on, unfortunately. Yeah, it's almost like COVID just sort of unmasked a lot of sort of the deficiency. I mean, I think that those working on the ground, you know, even folks here like in the libraries, so, you know, you just kind of see real life a little more. But I think that pandemic in, in some respects took the roof off of the structure and we're talking about, you know, structures and, and allowed us to kind of see a lot of like serious deficits that, that, that we have. And so obviously one major deficit is just sort of the stress and, and kind of the, the work with our child welfare system. So speaking of that, so what are some of the, th- have you seen, uh, what is like NC child like ev- advocating in regards to our, our child welfare system? Yeah, well, you know, we're, again, as we, we work on a lot of different policy issue areas, you right. know, and, and unfortunately, we can't give the attention to all of them that we sure, would like to sure. because, and there's other, and luckily, there's mm-hmm. other organizations in North Carolina yeah. doing work on particular issues, too, that are good and everything. But, you know, with child welfare, mm-hmm. one, you know, taking it down to the policy issue and just trying mm-hmm. to talk about you know, specific examples of things. One thing that we were proud of, and this mm-hmm. kind of gives you an idea of the work we do at NC Child. Mm-hmm. One aspect of that that um, is that we were advocating, along with others, over the past couple of years, that is part of the Medicaid transformation process that's happening mm-hmm. in North Carolina. And we can talk more about yeah, no, that. Yeah, we definitely need to but, talk about that. Yeah. yeah, but one thing we advocated for is it used to be up until now that if you were a parent who lost custody of a child, Mm -hmm. to social services um, and you were on Medicaid as a parent, you would lose your Medicaid coverage at that point in time. 
because you because you were now an adult without a child. And in North Carolina, if you're an adult without a child, you know, and, and you basically have very limited Medicaid options it's, it's for very coverage. It's punitive, it sounds right. like. That, right. Know, and so, we just paid up taking your child from you. And then, by the way, let's just rub salt in the wounds of that, you know, and, and go ahead and just strip you of your, your health insurance. Yeah. And, and again, like we, you know, these are circumstances like, you know, first and foremost, we, we, we want to care about the children and Absolutely. we don't want them to be in dangerous situations. But what we know is that, if a family is to be reunited, then right. the best chance for that to happen is for the parents to get the support yeah. and the services and the things they need. And if you take their insurance coverage away from them, then that's only going to make that harder. And so yeah. we, cha- we changed mm-hmm. that along with others. Yeah. Now the law has changed with, where if, mm-hmm. you are, if you're a parent in that situation, you will be able to retain your Medicaid coverage. That's great. So hopefully help get some services that you need. That's a policy fix that I think, you know, if you really think about it, really helps to A, take the stress off the child and actually promotes family reunification, right? Because it's like a lot of the people who are in problem with the DSS or, or whatever about, you know, the quote TPR, in fear of a TPR, the termination of parental rights. Um, a lot of that is like getting back to like things such as addiction, right? Um, and, and you need health insurance to pay for therapists and counseling and, and all of that stuff to be able to at least manage, if not kick said addiction, you take away the health insurance, then they kind of, you know, I don't know. I mean, what are you going to go find a witch doctor or something out there to kind of help you out? You know I mean? It's really, um, that, that's a really, so that, that really kind of gets to like NC child, like, cause I think like when people hear it, you know, it's kind of like, Oh, that's great. You're a child, but that's an actual concrete fix that that you're from your direct and grassroots lobby and i'd love to kind of t- talk a little bit about that model um that did produce an actual um result that doesn't on paper just cause oh well okay we stopped you know parents um who are on medicaid who then had their children taken from them from losing you know like their health insurance right but then you know if they ever want to have a chance to you know get reunified they've got to have the health insurance be able to at least pay for Things, you know, obviously they need that. It's going to, and a job, of course, but this is, you know, just as important in many respects. So, so you talked about direct and grassroots lobbying. I mean, I, and I think you can obviously direct as you're walking in Raleigh, but maybe you could talk a little bit about grassroots because I think that we, this is a grassroots kind of show program. And I think this yeah. is something that I think would definitely, um, you know, really kind of uh, uh, be of interest. You know, that I think most of the folks who do come to this program Maybe not so interested in walking the halls of Raleigh and, 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 and such, although maybe many of them probably might have been there for more on Monday or something like that back in the day. But, you know, I think, uh, I think, um, but, but the, the grassroots law, because it, that matters as well. Legislators, you know, I mean, they'll talk to a lobbyist, but, you know, there's also their constituents as well that have sway. Absolutely. And that's a big that's a part of NC Child's theory of change mm. is is this. We don't believe that we'll ever get the policy solutions and systems changes that we need if we don't have a large public voice, organized public voice pushing Mm -hmm. for that. Because, again, I can go or other advocates can go talk to legislators till we're blue in the face and we do that. But it's really all about getting communities behind these issues and holding elected officials accountable to make the changes that we want to see happen. And so that's not easy. I mean, we all know, I mean, it's a never ending uphill battle in the history of our democracy in this country. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's just something that, that I believe in. I mean, I love being a part of that kind of work, you know, Mm -hmm. bringing people giving them a sense of their own power. I mean, it's mm-hmm. about shifting the dynamics of power and doing that in a way that wins on real issues. 
um, because again, you know, when we talk about, we talk a lot at, at NC Child about problems versus issues. Problems mm-hmm. are these huge things that, you know, honestly are super overwhelming mm-hmm. and, you know, but issues are pieces of that problem right. that we can win on. And, um, you know, that that's kind of the, the strategy. So grassroots lobbying is about helping advocates understand how to educate others in their community, how to uh, effectively advocate with lawmakers, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, I mean, I'll just be blunt. We don't have a huge uh, civic understanding in mm-hmm. this country as to how the halls of government are working. And so it only adds to that uh, that feeling of folks just throwing their hands up in the air and going, you know, it's all corrupt. It's not yeah. for me. They're never going to listen to me. Who can, you know, what can I do? Mm-hmm. I know. And it probably plays into like some of your, your previous work as in Democracy NC that, you know, that if, if people, you know, don't see any wins, they don't see kind of anything changing, then you kind of like lose hope. They're like, well, what's the point of voting? What's the point of engaging? What's the point of like, who cares if it's the, the puppet on the left or the puppet on the right? You know, they get very, you know, it gets, very, it gets really, uh, um, what's the term, nihilistic, I think, um, and such. And so I think that getting some wins, and it sounds like your organization that helps communities at least get try to identify and get wins on issues. Because again, like you said, problem like, you know, childhood hunger, that is a huge problem, right? I mean, you know, you can have the statistics and such, but finding an issue like, I don't know, like a, like a, a law or, and or a bill that, you know, guarantees, you know, uh, feeding or, or, or food, you know, um, and I think that's, you know, I think, I think that's an interesting uh, take and why I think um, our communities really need to kind of work and, you know, really need to work with organizations like NC Child is that they can, you know, they've been kind of taking it on the chin, like really forever. And it's an opportunity to kind of, you know, get, get, get some, win, get some wins in the win column, you know, as far as, as far as community issues go. Um, and I think this kind of goes into what you talked about as your first prong, which was community engagement. So, because obviously, if you're going to have grassroots lobbying, you got to have some kind of community engagement. And so maybe, I don't know, and yet this is your definitely domain. So well, talk to us a little bit about the community engagement aspect of NC Child. Yeah, so we, we um, have developed and work with uh, what we call the Child Advocacy Network across the state. We call it the CAN for short, yeah. the Child Advocacy Network. And this is just, and anybody can be a member of it, an individual, a group, there's not dues or fees per se, but it's folks that Mm -hmm. self-identify as wanting to advocate around policies for children. And Mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do constantly is build that network, make it stronger, make it truly statewide. And we work you know, at the state level, we work with a lot of the, um, the the organizations like the North Carolina Pediatric Society or State Association of Social Workers or, mm-hmm. you know, the School Psychologists Association. I mean, go down the line. We work with all those groups. But then what we're what we really also want to try to do is dig down to the lo- local level where we're networked with folks mm-hmm. in local areas across the state, like in Mecklenburg County, for example, um, we work pretty closely with the Mecklenburg. Children's Alliance, which is a, okay. you know, a large collaboration of children service groups in Mecklenburg. And we have uh, local chapters or hubs that we call them of the Child Advocacy Network mm-hmm. in different places across the state. Like we've got one in Wilmington and Goldsboro and Greensboro and Ash in Asheville. And so all of these are just ways that we can hopefully uh, build up the network, of course, work more effectively to advocate on policy issues. And then we provide a lot of support. Like we try to, we do trainings and leadership mm-hmm. development activities and um, try to bring policies to, to folks' attention that they can advocate on good opportunities, things like that. Yeah. I mean, so I think what I heard initially about the Child Advocacy Network, the CAN, is that it's open to anybody. And so you know, definitely, um, I don't know, is there a website or something maybe we could pop in the chat that we could maybe get some folks here to, because I'm a member, I joined, you know, a number of years ago when I was at the Action Agency, and um, I can tell you that definitely being part, you get great newsletter, 
Um, and that might go into communication. We can talk about that, but definitely um, you'll get a, a newsletter at least every week, um, sometimes with videos in it. Um, and, you know, it gets you up to date about what's going on as far as policies affecting children and families in, in North Carolina. And it's really a good educational tool to kind of, and it also has calls to action. So you can like click sometimes like, you know, Twitter rise your, I don't know, Twitter rise, that's a word. I mean, you know, like send a tweet to your congressperson about mm -hmm. this or sign, be a signatory on this petition about, about, you know, something. I mean, it is, it's a, you know, a little bit goes a long way, right? So if three of us sign, you know, uh, a petition to uh, congressperson Bud or, or Alma Adams or somebody, eh, you know, but if like 30,000 of us sign it, you know, that's a little bit of a different, you know, a uh, piece of, uh, you know, because those are 30,000 voters that they may need to like, you know, um, try to uh, at least try to do something or at least appear to be doing, you know, something um, in, in that regard. Um, so, yeah, so I think, so would you say um, the CAN is the largest aspect of community engagement? Are there any other um, things as far as community engagement go beyond the CAN? I think it is the largest aspect of it, um, yeah. Rocky, but there's a few other things that are that are really cool, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of projects in particular. One is we have the Parent Advisory Council, which okay. we call the which we call the PAC. Uh -huh. And this is just a, a great program that, that we have been doing at NC Child since 2018. Mm -hmm. And this is a group of, this is a group of parents, you know, folks can stay on the PAC. A lot of times, you know, maybe a, a parent will stay on the PAC for one year, two yeah. years, three years, you know, we're, we're still kind of building it as we go. But mm -hmm. like currently, for example, it's 18 parents okay. who, who have children who are on Medicaid, either Medicaid or NC Health Choice, the okay. state children's health insurance program. So this is a specific niche of parents. Yeah. We work with them and then they go in and advocate um, with North Carolina DHHS and mm. with policymakers and others specifically about issues around the Medicaid system. So that's a really cool thing because Again, we're all what we're trying to do is have community centered advocacy more and more. Mm -hmm. And then the other project we have, which is kind of in a, a period of, of revamping right now, is yeah. the YAC, the Youth Advocacy Council. Okay. And that's a group of like high school age uh, okay. youth who, again, you know, learn about advocating and, you know, cool story. I mean, all of these in all of these groups, there's examples of victories, which is really cool. Like in Wake County, uh, a gr yeah, our young people a few years ago went to their school board and got them to change the tobacco policy because basically there was nothing in the tobacco policy related to vaping. And, yeah. you know, this is just something that the students identify. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I get I get an eye opener on some of these things that uh, I don't understand as much about anymore. But, you know, they were able yeah, to kind of say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, hey, all this stuff's going on. And so, like, they went to the school board and then they even got involved, like then the North Carolina Attorney General's office even um, reached out to our yak and they had conversations there because, you know, they had a big lawsuit that they won against one of the vape manufacturers, Jewel, hmm. and our youth got involved wow. in that. Too. So, you know, that that stuff is a cool oh, aspect wow, yeah. of our work, too. That's now that's really cool. I mean, because, yeah, I think when I think of the community engagement, I'm very aware of the of the can. But, you know, having something like the pack and the yak, you know, and, and, and giving um, ordinary people like the tools to kind of just really uh, to become advocates for themselves in their own kind of immediate communities. Right. So I think that's I mean, that really serves like a great a great function. I do see in the chat, and I think it's definitely a topic we said we would touch upon in our pre um, in our pre uh, Zoom thing. But it's a question from Lawrence, and he says the the mental health of children is growing concern after COVID nineteen. But what was on the NC Child radar regarding mental health uh, for children for before? So maybe maybe because I knew we were definitely going to talk about children's mental health. So maybe we could maybe talk about before COVID. COVID and going into the future. Yeah, Mr. Turner, thanks for the question. And, you know, cause it's hard to put a number one on issues because right. there's so many, but I mean, I'll be honest, the mental, the children's mental health crisis in North Carolina yeah. may be like the number one thing that we really need to get a handle on. And it's, it's, 
it's bad and it's in the sense too, from a systemic standpoint, I mean, there was a a study that came out a couple years ago um, that said North Carolina was dead last in the country, 50th in children's access to children's mental health services. Hmm. And that's just, it's just unacceptable. And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has only, again, thrown fuel on the fire, and it's unfortunate. And so what we're really trying to work with other partners to hear from community members and others, you know, we need a movement Mm -hmm. for children's mental health reform in this state. That's the bottom line. Like, it's got to be a people powered movement where we're all working together to force some of these changes to happen and for this to really become a top priority. I think we've got opportunities. You know, it's unfortunate, as we all know, oftentimes um, it it has to get really bad before something gets looked at and done. Mm -hmm. And it's really bad. Um, And so I do think we've got some opportunities to have this conversation with policymakers Mm -hmm. and make some real changes there's so many different ways that it can be addressed and needs to be addressed. And I don't claim to be an expert on, on all the ins and outs of the, of the mental health system. Let me just say that. But one huge thing, just Mm -hmm. to give a specific example of one huge thing we advocate for Mm -hmm. and think that it would go a long way to helping is increasing the number of school-based professionals that can support children who are in crisis or even children who are not in crisis yet. We know that schools are the place where Mm -hmm. children there, they show up and they interact and where uh, problems can be identified, whether they're physical health problems, mental health, et cetera. And North Carolina is not on par for the number of school nurses, school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors that we need to have in place in order to support these children. Um, Unfortunately, the burden becomes just more and more on the teachers to be all of these things, Mm -hmm. which is just not sustainable. And so one real direct way we've been advocating is we're basically Mm -hmm. saying to state policymakers, and a lot of this can happen at the local level too, you know, counties could kick in money and Mm -hmm. school boards, et cetera, to say, look, we need to increase the numbers of these professionals and get them in the schools and get them um, ready to support children. And, and another piece of that is like, even if we could make wave a magic wand and make that happen, we have to have those professionals available Mm -hmm. and going into those professions. And for example, being willing to serve because, you know, like, like one issue you have with school nurses and it varies from, you know, the, the amount of pay that a school nurse can get varies wildly from county Mm -hmm. to county and place to place. And a lot of times school based, the, the school can't competitive in the amount of pay that they're able to offer someone, you know, what, you know, yeah, I might want to be a school nurse, but if you're asking me to take a $30,000 a year pay cut versus what I'm making at Presbyterian, then what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, th- those type, you know, situations, I mean, there's layers upon layers, but that's a specific example of something that we're pushing really hard on. And we've made some progress on, we've gotten Mm -hmm. some more funding for the school professional Mm -hmm. type positions, et cetera, but we still got a long way to go. So, so in regards to children's mental health, were there any wins in the last budget for, for this issue? There was um, there was an additional there was additional funding that was put in the state budget to to mm-hmm. pay like an extra ten million dollars that mm-hmm. um, could be uh, provided to to various school systems to in number of school professionals uh, you know outside of teachers that they were that they were hiring. Um, there have been some other changes, like some technical changes to the administration of Medicaid transformation, yeah. and sort of how that is, you know, ha- mm-hmm. how that's interacting with the mental health system and such. So yeah. there have been some victories along mm-hmm. the way, but um, 
I think overall, and we're grateful for those, you mm-hmm. know, uh, but I think it's been a drop in the bucket in a lot of mm-hmm. ways for what's really needed out there. We're, we're just not putting enough resources in, in our opinion at NC Child into the mental health system and into the school systems overall mm-hmm. to support what's really needed. So you mentioned Medicaid transformation that obviously, you know, when I was exiting the nonprofit sector, returning to practice of law in like the late 19, that was on the tips of everyone's tongue. And then COVID became sort of the, obviously the topic that du jour, well, it just became our, our entire reality for a good, a good long while there. But, you know, for those of us who vote, those who aren't super familiar with the notion of Medicaid transformation, could you talk a little bit about what Medicaid transformation is and maybe even how it connects to um, children's mental health as, as one aspect? Because, you know, I think that's um, because obviously you've got mental, it's mental health, it's health insurance, it's got to make the connect. So maybe we can get, get some education out of this. Absolutely, Rocky. And uh, let me say it's an ongoing education for myself, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but, um, but, you know, moving so, target, isn't it? It's just kind of. That, <laughs> that's right. So. You know, in North Carolina for a while now, you know, we've had um, we've had a mental health system where um, we've had a we ha- where you have managed care organizations that mm-hmm. operate in different areas of the state and basically serve as an intermediary between, um, you know, federal monies that are coming in and the services that are provided and serve as those managed care entities for the physical health side of things in our state. We were a direct payer, pay for um, service, you know, fee for service type Medicaid system um, up to this point in time until what we did, you know, over this past few years is we transformed into a managed care system in North Carolina on the physical health side of things now. So now you have these, these, um, these uh, PHPs, these managed care provider based mm-hmm. entities who, again, they are getting the, the Medicaid funds and mm-hmm. they serve as an intermediary to try the idea being that they are able to work with the providers and create a system where you have stronger like mm-hmm. value based care, where you're getting healthier outcomes, mm-hmm. where you're minimizing overlap right. of services, things like this. And North Carolina prior to put it in perspective, there was there was like eight states that were not managed care up to right. this point, like 42 states had already moved in that direction. And North Carolina kind of finally took the plunge and did this. Now, let me say mm-hmm. this, though, mm-hmm. there there the verdict is really out, although this is the direction that everything has gone yeah. on whether this is actually a better system. Yeah. for people it, that creates healthier outcomes and gets people more yeah. services. That's the idea, but we'll yeah. see how it plays out. Yeah, my understanding is I guess the old system was, you know, like it was definitely Medicaid, money came from the feds, went to Raleigh, and, you know, doctors, you, you know, child, low-income child goes into the doctor, they got the Medicaid card, the doctor's like just, you know, ordering tests after tests and, you know, do it, you know, like you're going to come see me this time and and then just billing Medicaid directly, right? Like wherever the Medicaid office is, just billing them to, more to DSS office, I guess. I mean, um, b- billing them directly. It's not like this transformation um, is that, med- that that money that was going straight to Medicaid will go to Medicaid in Raleigh, but then it's going to be dispersed to, it sounds like, five large managed care entities that are going to go around and try to enroll uh, low-income children and families to be into their sort of, so this is a big deal, right? So I think that, yeah. you know, this is um, because, you know, if you have been a child and family involved in the Medicaid system, uh, very soon, you know, it's your, 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 your Medicaid provider is, is it's, it's not like this direct, you know, you're going to have to work with one of these carriers in, in, in a lack of a better sense. Right. Yeah. And, and it sounds like, um, and what you mentioned was like, they're moving towards outcomes of the state it sounds like from what I've read is that they're not, it's not just like, I'm going to build like, like, like billing, like regular insurance, right? I'm just like, okay, well, you need test A, test B, uh, you know, you need a scan, you need all this stuff. And then we're just going to throw it's that, that Medicaid is actually experimenting more with outcomes, right? So healthier outcomes and it, and it kind of leads into 
Uh, another term that you know you always you hear about, in the, particularly in the nonprofit social sector, which is social determinants of health, right? So Absolutely. now there's like an idea, um, and in fact, I think there's like a pilot thing in North Carolina that I, I'm sure they must have disbursed the money. I think the Mecklenburg Health Department probably got a good chunk of that 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 experimental pilot money, which is that the idea is that if uh, say for instance, okay. So the carrier, you're getting your four, you're now Medicaid saying you need to get healthy outcomes. It's not just about billing us for stuff, right? It's not just about just running up the test. Like if a, if a child comes in and they got asthma, we don't want to see them have asthma, you know, a while. And so then the social terminal said, well, if they have like a dirty carpet in their house, maybe we need to hire some nonprofit or some contractor go in there and, and make it a wood floor. And maybe that will get you the outcome of you know, having better health, better respiratory health than just giving you albuterol every damn time you come in, right? Because you can just be whipping right. your, you know, all the time, all the damn time. But if you've just got a messed up house, and I think that leads into a lot of actually opportunities for the nonprofit sector in general, right? Because, you know, I had this conversation on another platform with Don Jonas before he went over to Atrium and he was with yeah. uh, Care Ring. Yeah. And, um, you know, you know, there's a there is a future. And this is something for those of you in the social nonprofit sector where maybe your nonprofit is is um, maybe geared towards, I don't know, meals on wheels. Right. Maybe you're maybe you are the meals on wheels. It could very well that if, if someone has weight obesity issues and they need to eat healthier food, then maybe Medicaid will pay you to deliver, you know, healthier food to some senior. Right. It, it, it really kind of opens the right. mind of, of, of really your, your funding streams and, and, and well, and just, and just, just health in general. But it, like you said, the verdict is still out because again, you know, in this transformation in the middle of COVID, how are, you know, you know, how are people know they're on a new team? How do they know who their new team is? Right. It's almost like uh, we took the school systems and we just shook them up in a box and then throw it out there and go figure out what school you're supposed to go to. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's things are, um, it, it is a little, and I think that organizations like the library play a great role in helping to kind of, you know, educate, um, you know, folks in the community about sort of this new terrain, right. You know, this new normal mm -hmm. of what, at least definitely if you're a low income child family on, on Medicaid, like what it's going to look like. And I think for nonprofit services, you know, that knowing that that there is a movement, because Medicaid's a serious funder, right? I know nonprofits are always like, oh man, how are we going to like fund our mission? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can link your mission in with the social determinants of health and you're, maybe you never even thought that you could bill Medicaid, but, oh, well, you won't be necessarily billing Medicaid, but it'll be a flow through um, yeah. to you. And so that's kind of a transformative aspect there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so what's the current status of Medicaid transformation because I mean, I, I, I from NC Child's standpoint, I know you guys have been tracking it for a while. So where are we right now in 2022 with it? Yeah, so there's so there's enrollment opportunities from the the carriers, as you said, Rocky, have mm -hmm. been out, and folks, you know, had an opportunity, a choice, you know, ba based on to to choose one of those carriers mm -hmm. you know they could sort of look at a menu of like okay these are these are the things i like about this plan or that plan and opt into it and if they didn't do that which the majority of medicaid recipients didn't do that because you know maybe they didn't know they had to or they didn't understand or what have you they're going to be just kind of automatically put into one of those plans. It almost sounds like the navigator plans. with obamacare right it's like okay well you got the you know and then you got to go to some website and you got to start clicking around figuring out like what uh you know it's yeah and there are certain segments of of folks who have, you know, special health care needs or mm -hmm. other things, you know, who are are sort or in certain services that are like carved out from the, the transformation process as of yet. And those are going to be kind of layered in in the years to come. Now, again, you could have somebody on here, Rocky, that knows a lot more about the ins and outs than sure. I do to talk just through well, like but it but it's definitely like it's like you're saying it's moving towards mm -hmm. it it's changing the structure of it and going back to those social determinants of health. Yeah. I mean, it's like something that I, that I learned years ago, which is a basic thing, but it just struck me there where they say like, look, 90% of someone's health is not like your physical genetics. It's, uh -huh. 
all the other circumstances in your life. You know, are you driving 100 miles an hour on the interstate not wearing a seatbelt every day? You know, or, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's just like all the other surrounding factors. So it makes sense then that we would obviously be trying to address those other things to improve people's health. No, I mean, I think that it's, uh, yeah, it it definitely, when I kind of clued in on, I mean, it's still a pilot program, the social determinant, like at least for funding nonprofits. And and, and so you got to come up with, but if if the focus on outcomes, right, you know, we want to make sure that. You know, this child is obviously uh, managing depression, right? And they're in a, you know, a, a bad home or, or something, then it might need, there might need to be interventions like DV might be an issue, right? So a lot of the, the nonprofits that, you know, need to maybe need to get uh, more funding for more beds or more, you know, uh, you know, like sanctuary for, you know, um, victims of, of what well, I guess call it IPV now, you know, because it's not just, you know, but. Um, but well, you know what it is, right? You know, yeah. it's just, you know, and yeah. and so um, you know, I think that it's kind of it's kind of an interesting um, an interesting thing there. So it sounds like definitely NC Child is advocating hard for um, for children and families as far as Medicaid transformation and mental health. Um, what what about um, an area that I obviously spent some time? That's when we reconnected when I was running the Action Agency is early childhood education, and obviously. We got a unified um, system here in in in, in Mecklenburg, at least to, to some extent, trying to get uh, universal pre-K. I guess not unified, but no, no, there's nothing unified about pre-K. <laughs> I, I that. There's nothing unified about that. I mean, I know, universal, unfortunately. Yes. unified. No, that's there's, there's no sheriff and the, there's no superintendent of pre-K. <laughs> that would uh, now that would be some transformation. That would that would be a that would be a yeah. revolution. If that, that would be a, the revolution never anybody never knew about would be if there was there was like one person running pre K. So there's not. Yeah. <laughs> there's not. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing: in the United States, we don't have a public early childhood system. Mm -hmm. that supports parents and kids. I mean, in a lot of other developed nations, there is much more of that structure that's in place. In order to improve outcomes for children and support working families, et cetera, Mm -hmm. NC Child believes we need to be moving much more in that direction. We need to have a much stronger public investment in early childhood, which pays off tremendously. I mean, you know, Rocky, you know the stats. Every every dollar you put into early childhood pays off, you know, what, $12 down the road or something. Mm -hmm. But again, it's going to take public will. It takes us pushing that, you know, North Carolina, for example, I think we spend about 1% on mm-hmm. of our state budget annually on um, child care. Yeah. I mean, oh. so, and you know, the, of course there's home visiting and there's mm-hmm. this and that, but like, so really while it's complex and all that, we need to move, essentially mm-hmm. we need to move from Uh, this kind of market-based, unsustainable Mm -hmm. system that we have now where parents are paying a ridiculous amount of money, you know, to even put their children in child care. And we need to change that to a more publicly supported system. That would be the point of view of NC Child. And ultimately, in the bigger picture, that's what we're advocating for. But of course, we know it's about the, it's a problem versus issues thing, right? So Mm -hmm. it's about pushing around the issues that can make a difference. That's why Mm -hmm. I really am very interested too. I mean, at the state level, we're doing our part, but what some counties are doing to push for universal Mm -hmm. pre-K, I mean, the issue that, which I think is great, you Mm -hmm. know, and I, and so it's exciting to hear that Mecklenburg has a plan in Durham, but what's interesting is like, well, okay, Mecklenburg's doing that, but what's going to happen in Rowan County or Stanley Mm -hmm. County or wherever, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that, you know, given my like previous life, uh, you know, I mean, directly in the early childhood sphere is that, you know, I think, um, I mean, I still think that, and this is my bias, I think that the model is Head Start. You know, I think that you just make Head Start available to everybody. You don't just like means test it. And I think that you've got your, I mean, again, I'm extremely biased because I did see Head Start up close and I saw that it's extremely rigorously uh, uh, crap. And it's a very holistic system where, you know, you not, it's not just child care and it's not just child education, but we had social workers on staff working with 
parents and families and, and you know, trying to help them get jobs and help them stay in jobs. And, and it was a really uh, holistic thing that, and the sad thing is that we do so much good and then they would get into the public school system. And then within a year or two, they probably lose a lot of the things because, you know, they don't have the supports for families in the school system, right? But Head Start did, right? You know, so a lot of us were like, they'd be coming back to the action days, they're like, can, can, can you still help me, you know, trying to like get, get a job or, you know, and we had other programs like a workforce development program there as well uh, to help help those Head Start parents. But, you know, it's, um, it really is kind of like, it, 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 it is definitely, um, yeah, the, the hodgepodge of, okay, you got the hoity-toity childcare here where, you know, professional managerial class people are having to like call in advance to get a, a slot in waiting for one of these, like, you know, whatever super ch- preschool, you know, things there you've got, you know, obviously, and, and, you know, obviously COVID has kind of cra- changed a lot of things, but things are starting to kind of open back up again, but even like you've got Head Start and, 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 you know, they're, they're available but, you know, it's, it's there, yeah, there, there's a reckoning, I think, that really, you know, if we're, you know, calling folks essential workers and heroes and stuff, and we're not allowing opportunities for their children to, to, to be taken care of during the times where you are being an essential hero, you know, it's really, there's a real disconnect, um, in my opinion, you know, uh, between the rhetoric of, like, how we're, like, you know, showing out for, like, working families and what we're actually, you know, putting in there, and I think those are, you know, I mean, that's like kind of like like the problem, but I think like what um like so with this particular issue, what are some of the things that MC Child is like looking at, like taking the chunk of the problem of, you know, either access to early childhood or access to child care? And what are some of the things that that maybe the last budget you looked at and what maybe what are you looking at going forward as well? Yeah, it's a great question rocky um hopefully you can still hear me good here yeah um yeah so again looking at the specifics and and that's you know while it gets very weedy and detailed that is what nc child does is like we try to get in there and push on these specific issues and a lot of times the uh, the challenge we have is to you know of course also merge that with public support Support and mm-hmm. help everybody be on the same page. So, you know, in the bigger picture, of course, we're always pushing for the state to just put more money in the budget towards mm-hmm. the early education system around to, to fund, you know, get kids off the child care subsidy waiting list to, you know, fund um, wages, the wages program, which is increases pay and support mm-hmm. for child care workers, et cetera. One specific thing that we're really focused on and have been for a couple of years is the um, the amounts that providers get in different counties across the state um, mm-hmm. for, of subsidy payments. Um, you know, if they if they are caring for a child who is mm-hmm. there um, through child care subsidy, those amounts are different. It varies from county to county. So a provider gets more money in Mecklenburg County, for example, for providing for that child than they do in Rutherford County or whatever the case may be. And now there might be some differences, obviously, in sort of the cost of care, but it's not that big of a difference, you know, overall. And so we've got a big imbalance. And so you know, to, to just make a long story short, we're trying to equalize the amount of child, the, yeah, more equity across the state mm-hmm. that providers would receive in child care subsidy payment and bring up the amounts in a lot of those counties that would then help uh, centers be able to take children uh, who are, uh, you know, on who are getting subsidy and provide mm-hmm. more care, et cetera. Well, I know we're getting close to the end of the hour here, but I do know we talked about the transformation of Medicaid, but I mean, this has obviously been an issue since uh, since we had President Obama around, right? Is, is the expansion of Medicaid in this state. And I, was, I know we didn't get it in this round, but I don't know, if you pull out the magic eight ball and what what does what does Adam, the, the, the cat herder of NC China, I definitely want to get into that, 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 that title. Uh, see in this upcoming um, uh, legislative session, can we get it done this time? 2022 is going to be the year, Rocky. 
I, I right, you heard it here, folks. Right. This is this eye, right? This is I, it's, it's like we're going to the championship, right? It's like this is a year that you know the Hornets are well, maybe not, the Hornets are not going to get the championship this year, maybe next year, but not this year. But but this year, maybe we can get Medicaid expansion, right? What what are, what do you see on the ground that you think is um are have the has the as the, as the Republican Party kind of moved a little, and, they, and maybe they're worried about other things that they're not quite like as intransient about this issue or. Or what? What has kind of changed? Yeah, the, they still have domination of those houses. Yeah, quite quite frankly, there's just more appetite and support for the idea of doing this amongst Republican leaders in the state of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Democratic Party leaders for a while have been yeah. supportive and said they wanted to do this, and there's just been a big um, partisan divide for the most mm-hmm. part. But after years and years of advocacy and, uh, you know, folks looking at how it's working in other states, et cetera, we've really had a shift in the attitudes to the point where now there's a special committee meeting in Raleigh just to talk about Medicaid expansion and other health care access issues. They're bringing in, you know, conservative speakers and others from across the state. Governor Kasich from Ohio was speaking to the group in Raleigh on Tuesday. He's a Republican governor who enacted Medicaid expansion in his state and said that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he felt like it's one of the great greatest moral triumphs he's ever been a part of and thinks it's probably why he ended up being governor of Ohio in his mind. Um, So it's very interesting. And you just and so just the support has grown and grown. And it does. It just seems like the time is now we have a very serious opportunity. And what the legislative what what many Republicans in the legislature who control the legislative chamber in North Carolina are saying is that they're going to talk about this through the summer and they're going to have a vote on it um, prior to the November elections. And so mm-hmm. we're really hopeful, you know, North Carolina is one of 12 states now uh, who does that does not have Medicaid expansion. Mm-hmm. If we were to do this, it would it would provide opportunity for you know anywhere from 500 to like 700,000 people in North Carolina um, mm-hmm. to access Medicaid. Uh, many of which, over 100,000 of which, this is the angle and see child mm-hmm. come. We come from many angles, but many of those are parents. We have mm-hmm. uninsured parents who have children in the home. Their children have Medicaid coverage, but right. the parents are uninsured. Mm-hmm. Um, it would help with that. It would help with our um, w- our, our really bad um, infant mortality rates. We think it could be helpful there, et cetera. So, mm-hmm. I'm not just blowing smoke. I'm really hopeful, and I really think this is going to be the year. Here's a from our last show. We had Ken Shore from uh, Charlottesville. You know, he's retiring and wanted to kind of do a tribute show to his career. And and you know, the one thing that he ta- one of the things he talked about was when they had the child tax credits. You know, sort of like that. In and that there was a point there, not so much right now. That based on the statistics, we have child poverty at least for a good chunk of like 2021 there. Um, and so, I mean, based on, I know that's gotta be an issue that NC Child has been tracking, but what do you see sort of from both obviously a state and, and to what extent that you've got your folks on the in DC, what do you see sort of like as far as um, renewing? Cause I know in the last budget, at least I don't, I don't know. I mean, is, is, do we, will we see um, you know, that because it was nice, you know, like you, you got children and they would just, you know, instead of waiting until your tax time, they would just, you know, put it right there, like a u- universal basic income kind of like boom into your thing. And and people weren't just, you know, buying shoes and stuff. People were paying bills and actually buying food and doing, you know, sustainable things. And, you know, the numbers, you know, the numbers didn't lie. You know, it did, you know, children were moved out of the poverty level just by that little fix, right? That little just, you know, Instead of just, you know, just just giving people some money. I mean, that was kind of a, kind of a radical idea, you know, like maybe if I just, you know, gave me a thousand dollars, you know, extra every quarter, then, you know, maybe I, my child would have some food, you know, I mean, my help, right? Imagine that. I yeah, know. imagine that. Well, it's... what do you see? I mean, is there, I mean, again, like, I, I, I don't know, like, what stomach there is at the state level to kind of play around with that, but, you know, do you see anything at the federal level? I mean, they're still, you know, they're still in office until November, right? Until, you know, mostly, I mean, do, do you think that they're going to like at least 
you know, they're trying to institute this back in at least for uh, maybe get it retroactive to fiscal year 2022 for everybody. I'd love to see it, Rocky, you know, and of course, we're doing what we can to advocate for that and many other things at the federal level. I mean, we do we do some as are people all over the country. Right. You're right. The, the data doesn't lie. I mean, the child tax, the enhanced credit that was put into place lifted a bunch of families and children out of poverty. And so we'd love to see it extended. I just, but I also just, uh, you know, I can't even predict at the federal mm -hmm. level, you know, there were now with, with thing, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just such a tough time, right? <laughs> with, this world, with world events and inflation and COVID. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's really hard to get the votes. It's really hard to, mm -hmm. to get the votes, whether it's, you know, more money for the child tax credit, more money for early education, more money mm -hmm. for whatever. We're like almost there on all of it, but how it gets over the top is, is just really a question um, that mm -hmm. it, it, it will have to see. I mean, it, I it's, it's a tough, I, I don't, it's a, it's tough for me to envision something. It's kind of like picking your brackets for the for yeah. March Madness and not watching a single college game like I did this past. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, it's like well, uh, you know, it's kind of like predicting who's going to win, right? It's the. Right. It, 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 I mean, if if we're de and and you know, uh, perspective is reality with politics so much. I mean, if folks are, as long as folks are going to fill up their gas tank and it costs 425 a gallon and, you know, there's, there's, we're on the verge of the third world war. It's hard for me to envision, you know, some kind of robust spending package passing yeah. through Congress, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, gang, we are, we've gone a little bit over, but, you know, obviously we were here to educate and we want to make sure that everybody gets to know a little bit more about MC Child. It's a really important work. And also the issue that it involves itself every day. So we kind of get a slice of life about the work that Adam and his organization are doing. But obviously, this is an opportunity to ask some questions. So if you want to like know more about what MC Child is doing, if there's a pet child issue that you didn't hear get brought up, maybe you know you could uh, bring it up now. You can either unmute yourself or, or put the question in the chat. I know Chrissy got questions. I know she's always got questions. She, 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 she's at a service desk right now. So. Okay. I know she's always. Um, I think you got a question, Greg. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm just going to go to teacher mode now. Every, <laughs> every question I generated, um, you jumped the gun on me, Rocky. You, you, okay. you asked him exactly what I was going to ask. So. I will say that I, um, I, I admire you, Adam. You seem to be uh, swimming upstream in, a, in the most. Um, smooth way <laughs> so i know it's got to be <laughs> well i appreciate it greg i don't know if that's true or not but you know we'll we'll keep trudging forward and um uh, oh I have yeah, a Diana's got a question. Question. um so um thank you for um putting this together i'm glad i'm here um i work in north mecklenburg county around lake norman uh, regularly thought of as very affluent Davidson, where my office is, is the most affluent <laughs> community in our state. Um, however, um, not all of Mecklenburg, you know, North Mecklenburg is affluent. So I work with several groups trying to um, pull together and just, you know, start doing some collective power. <laughs> you know, how can we come together to advocate for some changes in our area? So one of the things you mentioned that I'm really interested in is training for folks, grassroots training. Um, I know I could probably look it up on your website, but if you could talk a little bit about how I might connect groups. It's literally neighborhood groups that I'm working with, you know, grand, great grands, grands, aunties, cousins, dads that are like, I really want better for my family. How can I help them? But none of us know anything about lobbying or <laughs> advocacy. How could I get us plugged into some training? Oh, I love that, Diane. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Um, my goodness, that area and just how it's changed, right? It's just wild. Um, yeah, so we do, I mean, you know, we do a variety, like one thing that I, that I do a lot of is like an advocacy 101 training. 
you know, that I can do in like an hour that just lays out like a lot of the basics around advocacy. Be happy to do something like that if you've got a group of folks. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website and look at our um, like what's coming up trainings and events page, we did we did an advocacy 101 back in February that's even recorded that you can like okay. share the recording with folks and they could watch that. There's another module on there meeting, you know, how to have effective meetings with elected leaders. So I guess I would I would say, you know, maybe start out, you know, watching that video, sharing that video, but right. don't hesitate to reach out to me too. If if then after that or at some point, you know, you all want want some more training or pointers, you know, we try to do what we can to customize things to fit people's needs. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. We got a small little grant with Smart Start to do some investigation about what our specific neighborhoods needed to better connect. Um, and that is, such, <laughs> I don't know how to make that bigger. I just know that we're supposed to have a strategic plan by June. <laughs> so, um, any guidance around that would be great too. Um, you know, I have, I'm connected to people. I, I know what people, I can listen and hear what they want, what's working, what's not, but then to take what's working, what's not to a uh, bigger than that um, is kind of where we're at, but we're at the beginning of that. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. And I know it's, it's, it's a lot to think about, you know, just one concept, maybe, I don't know what, you know, smart start is suggesting around structure or whatever but you know an old social work favorite is like doing an asset map mm -hmm. you know I don't know if y'all have talked about you know where you're just really looking at okay what are the assets we have mm -hmm. in our communities you know things that maybe not even as um, apparent outwardly or something but sort of like mapping some of those can be a way to kind of come from like a strength-based perspective but you know, then as you get more, maybe it, I'll say this, I'm always a big believer in honing in on an issue or two that, you know, maybe there's, there's some agreement in the group of like, yeah, there's all this stuff, but you know what, like we really need, you know, it's really about affordable housing or whatever. And just like, then just like trying to get as specific as possible and putting in a plan to like, Hey, let's push for this issue or two in our area. Oh, thank you for reminding me about doing an asset map. We're going to get on that right now. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Great. No, I think, uh, you know, and again, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for coming on today's, uh, you know, program. And obviously thanks to the, uh, to the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library System, which, you know, again, is providing, you know, education and really great services to the nonprofit sector, to the social sector, just to regular citizens and communities in the Mecklenburg and even outside area. So um, we got any other questions before we, 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 we start our adjournment process? Yeah, nothing other than a, a comment. Just uh, keep in mind, all these programs are archived on the library's YouTube channel. So they're um, in perpetuity. You can go there to view those. And um, yeah, Adam, thank you again uh, for joining us this morning. All right, everybody. We'll have a great weekend and we'll see you next time on the next uh, Friday's Rocky, most likely sometime in April. Right, sounds good. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll let you know. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.